about a very important lesson. In fact, it, uh, I think it is the core of the gospel. Uh, interesting enough, it's uh, the shortest letter Paul uh, wrote that we have in the Bible. And yet it uh, has the, the biggest uh, message of any of the uh, books in the New Testament. And so it's a, I think it's a book that's often over, a letter that's often over uh, seen. People kind of pass by it because it's, it's, it's really a, just a personal letter from Paul to, um, to one other man. And it's so short. I think a lot of people look over it. Well, this must not be important because it's short. But as we look at it, I think you're going to see that it is a critical letter uh, and it's a critical lesson. And I, I, I hope that you enjoy it. I'm going to try and make my uh, talking part uh, a little more brief because I want to have you participate in this one especially because this is a subject, uh, as I said, that's not only important, but it's a subject that's oftentimes misunderstood by Christians. It may be one of the reasons that God has it in our Bible. You remember the context before I go into the point of the, I think the point of the uh, letter. Yeah, let me just kind of bring you back, uh, even though you may have read, read the letter, let me just bring you back uh, kind of a summary of it. If you can picture Paul, he's in the prison there in Rome, he's awaiting his, uh, his trial and the reason he's getting a trial, by the way, is because he's a Roman citizen. If he hadn't gotten a uh, if he hadn't been a Roman citizen, he wouldn't be staying around the prison very long. He wouldn't be waiting a fair trial because uh, the rest of the world uh, who were slaves, uh, they didn't get that kind of a trial. Uh, they just got somebody to tell them what's going to happen to them, and it was very fast. One of the things you'll notice if you study the archaeology of the Roman Empire is they didn't have prisons all over the place. In fact, there's only been one prison located in the ruins. And you say, why is that? It's because the Romans did not look at slaves as having any rights to having a trial. And so remember this, uh, there, are, there was a tremendous number of slaves, the whole population, think about this, the entire population of the Roman empire at this time was around 50 million people. Um, and so, I mean, you're talking about the entire Roman Empire having no more than about, what, a uh, little more than twice the size of Texas. And yet, half of the people, half of those 25 million were slaves. So you got 25 million free people, 25 million slaves, and these slaves uh, had no rights. They were looked at as property. So if they did something wrong, it was pretty much left up to the, the people who owned them to take care of them. And so when they did something wrong, their master would make the decision. Did they need a beating? Uh, did they need privileges taken away? Or uh, did they need to be uh, killed? And they could just make the decision. So if you had a good master, it might not be so bad. If you had a bad master, uh, it could be pretty rough. Oftentimes they were just sold if they were uh, caught doing something wrong or were sold to somebody else. They didn't want them around. But uh, in this case, uh, which often happened with slaves, especially when an owner had more than one slave, if they had a bunch of them, the slaves would find ways to escape. And they would usually run to one of the big cities, Rome being uh, the largest. They would go to the big city hoping they could hide. But as was usually the case, uh, they could not hide. People would spot them. And they would then take them, uh, uh, capture them, and take them in uh, to the jail. In that jail, they would usually only spend one night. Uh, sometimes they would spend a couple nights because they had to wait till they were sentenced. Oftentimes, they would be returned to their master, so he would punish them because the Roman government, uh, if they couldn't find out who they were, they would uh, sell them to somebody quickly because they did not keep him in, in jail. So here's this fella, his name is Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave uh, who lived in Colossae. He may have been a slave ever since he was a kid, but he was owned by a master named Philemon. And it's possible that Philemon had lots of slaves, but this particular one ran away, he went to Rome, he got caught, put in prison, 
He was in there the same time that uh, Paul was. And you remember Paul was chained to the wall and here this slave is. He's in there temporarily and he meets Paul and he discovers this is an un unusual man, a man who was chained to a wall waiting possible execution and yet he talked about having freedom, real freedom. And I'm sure that Onesimus was blown away with the idea that this fellow felt like he was free when he was, a, in fact, he was being treated like a slave. And of course, you know, Paul led him to Jesus. He accepted Christ as his savior. And uh, then Paul decided to pay his debt, whatever he owed, sent him back. And he said to Onesimus, now you go back to your master and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write a letter to him because the word that I've gotten is that Philemon, back when he was uh, your master, and uh, he was not a follower of Jesus, but one day as a wealthy businessman, he was traveling to Ephesus. And while he was in Ephesus, he heard me preach the gospel and he got saved. And he went back to Colossae and he started a church and his home. And he let all the new Christians come to his home. They had, of course, all of them then had house churches. And so it was in his home that the Colossian church started. And you know, Paul never got to Colossae. Uh, he simply instructed them and sent them that letter that we call the letter to the Colossians. So he said, you go back and I'll write this letter and I'll tell, Onesim, uh, tell Philemon to receive you back, not as a slave, but to receive you as a brother in Christ. And uh, Onesimus said, okay, I'll go. And he, in the letter, you remember, he wrote and told uh, Philemon, now look, this guy has accepted Christ. He's a brother. I want you to accept him. You know, you owe me, Philemon, because I led you to Christ and you've been free from your sin. And if you have anything else that, uh, that he's done that's wrong, you just count it that I'll pay it back. And, uh, but he said, but let remember, you owe me a lot. You owe me your soul. So he kind of he kind of did a number on him. He said, it's better that you not make anybody pay anything you already owe. And let's see just how strong your faith is and see how authentic your faith is. If you're willing to forgive this fella and not treat him as a slave anymore. From this story, which is this, that's all this letter is, the letter to Philemon uh, about Onesimus. From this story, we can glean some important truths. And of course, the main thing about this, this whole uh, letter is, Paul is talking about what real freedom is, what it really means to be free, to be a Christian, is as we use the word to be saved, saved from and saved for something. I, I may have told this story before, but it's, it's worth telling again. Um, not long ago, uh, Phyllis posted on Facebook a picture of a little cardinal that was born on our front porch in a nest. And the little uh, fella, uh, we watched him as he first came out of, the, uh, out of the egg. And I mean, he was a pitiful looking little creature and he could barely stand up. And then we kind of watched him grow and grow and grow. And one day uh, the little creature um, actually came out of the nest. And a couple of weeks later, we saw him out on the deck in our back. And he was flying around out there and he perched and started eating the food. I mean, it was a wonderful thing to see him move from the nest and be flying around eating food out of our bird feeder. And I remember how I used to, years ago, I used to talk about the real meaning of what, it, what, it, what the Bible means when it says be free. Because that word uh, free, that word sozo in the Greek, is a word that really means to be untied. If you would picture, if I had taken that little uh, baby cardinal when he just came out of that egg and I had tied string around him so that his wings would not be able to move, he would have stayed in that nest until he fell out or until his mother or daddy pushed him out. And then he would have walked around on the ground and maybe eventually he would have gotten that string off, but you know what would have happened. He'd never been able to fly because he wouldn't have developed those muscles. He never would have really known what it was like to be a cardinal. 
to be able to do all the things that God made him to do. And that is a really, that's a very good picture of what it means to be free, to be saved, to be set free. It's the picture of being untied, being cut loose from the things that keep you from being what you were designed to be. In the Bible, there is a sense that that is the primary message of the scriptures. We call it salvation, which I think, unfortunately, that word is oftentimes totally misunderstood. It has so many cultural implications. But the picture is, the words to save, salvation, is the picture of being set free. But I think it's important to realize when you talk about the biblical idea of freedom or being set free, it's got three sides to it. We're free from the things that we cannot do. We're free for, that means we're free to be able to do the things that we were intended to do. And we're free by something. And of course, uh, the Bible yeah. says we're free by God's power and God's love. Oftentimes, I think we misunderstand the whole idea of what it means to be free. And so in our culture, especially here in America, uh, and it's been a struggle for, for cultures all around the world, the idea of having freedom oftentimes is not the biblical idea. The idea of being free means to have, be able to do anything you want to do, to be, have no responsibility. I remember when I was in high school, one of my fellow students uh, in the 11th grade said, I'm sick and tired of these teachers telling me what to do. I'm sick and tired of, this, of the principal telling us what to do. I'm just gonna quit this thing. And I saw him the next morning, he was standing out on the street corner as our bus came by and he waved at us with a big smile on his face. Basically, he was communicating to us guess what? I don't have to go to school. I don't have to study. I don't have to take tests. I'm free. And you know, it crossed my mind. Was he free? He was free from, but he wasn't free for. He thought he was free, but not in the biblical sense. He would not be able to accomplish the things that God intended for him more than likely because he had this rebellious spirit. He had this attitude what was going to happen to him, do you imagine? Well, he may change, but if he didn't change, I'll tell you what's going to happen. He'd want to get a job that he couldn't get. He'd want to be able to accomplish some things he couldn't accomplish. He'd want to be able to feel good about himself, and later he would feel bad about himself. And I can go on with a long list. So you can see what I mean. True freedom is more than not having to do things or being able to do anything you want to do. Freedom has to do with being able to accomplish the thing that you were created to do. And we have a certain number of things that God created us to become and to do that it takes his power to do it. That's what this letter to uh, Phi Philemon is about. It's about Philemon, you were set free. You were set free from the, from the chains, from the ropes that tied you down. The, the wealth that you were using to find your freedom, you didn't find it there. From the power you had to overcome other people, the using of other lives, you were, you were bound by that. And he said, you were set free from all that and found your freedom in Jesus. You were forgiven. You were given a new purpose, an eternal purpose. You saw more than the here and now. You saw eternity. You have a new kind of freedom. Now the question is, has it affected you enough that you're going to follow the purpose you have to set other people free? So the story of Philemon and the story of Onesimus is a story that's important to all of us. And I wanna just mention in the context, and I want you to hear this, that this whole idea of the freedom that God gives us uh, is something that we have to look at for our own lives in our own country. Because freedom comes in many shapes, doesn't it? I mean, uh, in fact, I'm going to ask you a question a little later, uh, a question about this whole idea of, of personal freedom and social freedom. And I'm going to ask you the question of, you know, what, what does it mean to be free in, in uh, not only in your spirit and your eternity, but free in your everyday life? 
when are you not free? What, what are some things that we could use as parallels that show the difference between being free and being a slave? Is it possible that we have slaves in our own society? Not the old fashioned kind, but the very deep meaning of people who are not able to be and to do what God intended. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about slavery. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I, I would like to sometime, but today I just want to give you a quick summary of what I think is a biblical view of the idea of slavery. Because there's a, I think there's a pretty uh, lot of, of, of important and legitimate questions about slavery in the Bible. Whenever you start talking about a person being a slave or the whole concept of people having slaves, it gets sticky, doesn't it? Because all cultures have had slaves, including uh, the Hebrew culture. We see that slaves were popular in the Bible times. And so we ask the question, what is the biblical view? What is God's view? If, if you were to have God come to our Sunday school class today and speak to us, about slavery, what would he say? I think we can see exactly what he would say as we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's the same God. I think that for us to understand slavery, we have to look at what we do with any issue. I don't care what the issue is, we as Christians do not come with a philosophical position. We don't come, in other words, trying to see what do we think makes the most sense or what's the most practical. We say, what is it what is God's character? What does God himself show us about a subject? And so when we look at slavery, we have to look at it in the context of looking at the activities, looking at the will of God in the Bible. Let's look at it in the Old Testament, and then let's look at it if we want to see what God's character is like. The Bible says the best place to look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus and how he would look at slavery, how he would look at uh, being a slave. Well, first of all, when you look at the context of uh, trying to understand God's view, you have to look at the creation story. The creation tells us a lot about God. It tells us that God designed us as humans to have a free will. God himself is the definition of freedom. If you want to know what it means to be free, look at God. What is he like? Let me put it in everyday language. God was not bound. God is never bound. God is able to do whatever he wants to do. He wants to do what's best. He's able, that means he is all powerful. He's free. Nobody can control God. Notice the second thing about God in the creation. He's not only, not only able to do it, God is able to know everything according to the Bible. You look at the, the, all the way through the Bible, but you looked at the creation story, God knows what he's going to do. God knows what he's going to create. He's all knowing. He is free in his knowledge. He's also free in his love. He loves his people. He wants them to bet. He wants to love. Them. In fact, the, the implication in the creation is he created us because he wants to love us. He wants to have a relationship that means. He wants to have an honest relationship. In the creation, we also see that if you look at the character of God, is that God was with his people. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's able to be with his people. In other words, if you look at the idea of God himself, the character of God in the Old Testament, you see the definition of what it means to be free in God. And then it says we are made in his image. Part of what that means is we are made like God. We're not gods, but we're made much like God. He wanted us to have a relationship. One of the elements of being like God is we have a will. He gave us the will to choose. What does that mean? That means to be free. Part of being free means that you not only are start out able to do all these things, but you have the, the ability to make your own choice. And so you look at all this, you see what God has done, you see what God's designed you to do, and then you can choose. Choose to go your own way. And what does the creation story tell us? It tells us that as long as they chose to follow God's plan, to follow the, to do the things that God said, guess what? 
they're going to be exactly satisfied and happy and they're going to be filled with joy and peace and prosperity. But when they choose to not use their freedom for good, but use their freedom for them for their own self, what happens is everything falls apart. We call it the fall. So that's the second thing you have to look at to understand this whole idea of slavery. A slave is somebody who makes the bad choice or somebody who has a choice made for them. If you look at the fall, the fall is the story of rebellion. It's a story of bad choices. We lose freedom because of choices we make or choices that people around us make. Look at it this way. You may not be a slave to something because you chose it. You may be a slave because of your parents, because of somebody around you. And you become a slave. In other words, the whole environment, the, the created order was affected by the fall. So slavery, slavery is both a choice and a consequence. The Old Testament, as you go from creation all the way through, you begin to see that God is very sympathetic to each individual who can be set free from their consequences, can be set free from all that it means to be a slave to people or to things, but that the reason that we're slaves, the reason we get into these places where we're not able to do what God wants us is because of our own choices and the choices of people around us. The third thing, if you look to see what is, what is this whole idea of slavery, is you look at the Exodus. The Exodus tells us that slavery is something that comes from the consequences of our, of our culture, the consequences of sin at its broader level. And here's another point that you look at it. Slavery has always been not only a choice. People get into things because, get into bad things because they make the wrong choice to, to rebel against God. But it also says, it also says sometimes the culture around us has to be corrected. So part of freedom is not just individual, it's communal. And that's what we see in our country right now, isn't it? The, the, the last thing I want to mention uh, is that you have to look at the incarnation. You have to look at the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus tells us that God looked at all of this and he said to himself, it's time for me to come in to myself, to bring me freedom itself, the possibility of freedom for everybody, for me to come and to give people free. And so the book of Matthew, if you remember the gospel, the first of the, of the gospels, Matthew was written to say the Messiah has come. God has come to set his people free. In fact, when Jesus was born, what, what was his name? His name was Yesu, which is the word for free, set free. To, to We call it to be saved. But Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one to set us free. And, and what was his purpose? His purpose in life was to set his people free. And so he was here to bring freedom, personal freedom, collective freedom, social freedom, in other words, he was trying to help people get back to what God intended for and what God designed them to be. So he then set up the church, meaning not the organization, but the collection of, of people who were set free personally and gave them the task to do what? To use their freedom to help other people find this freedom in Christ, to find this eternal freedom. So in a way, if you look at this whole thing, what do you see? You see, the Bible is saying God made us in a certain way. He gave us a free will, and we must always have the struggle that Paul talks about. The struggle between I want to do this because of my culture, because of my inclinations, but I also want to do what God tells me because I know it's the best for me. And we struggle between those two, and therefore we can become slaves. The word slave, by the way, is the word doulos in the Greek language. It's a word that really means to be, uh, be under the control of someone else. It's to be owned by someone else. That was the old definition of doulos. Uh, and, and so the idea of being a slave was the idea you have no rights anymore. 
you have, you're owned, you're a possession. And so whenever a person became a Christian, Paul said, we truly are still slaves, but we're choosing who is going to be our master. And so what did, who, what did Paul call himself? A slave for Christ. And by the way, the Greek word for Christ, uh, I mean, the Hebrew word for the Greek word Christ is Messiah. So he said the Messiah, God himself coming to the world, I'm going to choose that he is my master and I am his slave. Not the sense that I have no, no, no rights, I have no abilities. He's saying my ability is going to be to please him, to obey him, to follow him. So the question is, Paul basically says, none of us are, are truly free to do nothing. It's the idea that we are abled, enabled for our knowledge, for our ability to perform, our ability to know what's right. We can't be slaves to somebody else. And if we're slaves to ourselves, we're the biggest fool of all. He said, it's choosing your master. So Paul therefore taught, and Jesus taught, that we are to all look at ourselves as being subservient, being submissive. The question is, who will we make our Lord? In the first century, when the Romans began to persecute the Christians, you remember there are stories, if you want to read some horrifying stories, they give an example of this, read Fox, the, uh, Fox's Book of the Martyrs. It tells of many of these early church leaders, some of them were actually disciples of Jesus, who were taken, taken into the arena, and they were asked this question. The word for slave is doulos. The word for Lord was kurios. And the executor would say, uh, he would say, Curios Caesar or Curios Jesus. And the Christian would say, I'm a doulos of Curios. They would say, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. I am a slave of my master Jesus. And if they didn't, if they didn't say Jesus, they were executed. I mean, if they didn't say Jesus, if they said, I am, I am the master of Caesar, they were free. If they said Jesus, they were executed. The question is sometimes accepting Jesus as our Lord in everything means that we see ourselves as his servants. Not therefore we have a bad master, but we have a good master. I want to pause now and say, as you look at this whole idea of freedom and Jesus came to set us free, let me ask you a few questions. And I'd like to hear some of you share your ideas on this because I think uh, just hearing each one of us talk about it may give us some insights into what we've learned over the years. Why is slavery, why is not being able to do what God, why is it so bad? I mean, you hear some people say, well, you know, some people, uh, they need an owner. And if the owner's good, what's wrong with it? That was one of the arguments of the Southern plantation owners. Some of the arguments that people say why uh, there were slaves in the Bible, uh, that some of the great uh, biblical heroes had slaves. So maybe it's because they were better off having them as uh, slaves and having these people go off on their own. So why do you think it's so bad that there's slavery in any form? Anybody have a thought? What makes it bad? If you, uh, if you can have an answer or thought, uh, be sure to hit your little uh, unmute button so we can hear you. Who has a thought? Bill, it's Jim, the, the lack of ability to exercise your, your free will. Mm, that's good. You know, some people would say, Jim, that, uh, that some people exercising their free will gets them into more trouble. They really need a master to tell them what to do. What do you say to that? 
<clears throat> you can have free will, but that doesn't preclude you from listening. You may not want to follow, but you can still listen. Mm -hmm. I think in our day, um, in our day, we got people who kind of want to do whatever they want to do. And um, some would say, well, individual freedom is, is, uh, is gone too far in our country. Uh, we need more uh, mastership, more people who control these people who are, who are just doing anything they want to do. Um, it is a question, isn't it, about how do you, how do you balance individual rights and, uh, and the right of authority? I have uh, a little bit of a story. It's, it's a shade different, but I think there's a lot of correlation here. When I was in seminary, I taught English as a second language at the federal prison there in the Fort Worth. In fact, I like to say I got my education at, I mean, I got my degree from the seminary, but I got my education at the federal prison. And we had a, a big problem with recidivism, which means the prisoner would, would serve the term that they were supposed to serve, they were released. And in a matter of weeks or months, they were right back in prison. They, for years, all of their choices had been taken from them, every decision. They didn't even get to decide what they wanted to eat or what time to eat. And then all of a sudden they're out and they don't know how to make decisions. Well, in God's wisdom, I think when he, when he sets us free from whatever it is, if it's a person or if it's an attitude or a belief system, whatever he sets us free from, he doesn't just set us free to fly away. He sets us free, but he gives us something inside us to guide us because he knows we're going to mess up. And without God's spirit inside us, I think we become like those prisoners that I saw set free and in six weeks they were back in jail because they didn't have anything inside them, no guide to replace the decision makers that had been in their lives before. I think that's a very important point. And then I would tag onto that while some of you others are thinking about that question is that just like these prisoners that Phyllis knew who came back to the prison, um, that, that was uh, one of Paul's big emphasis to uh, Philemon. And that is that whenever you're first set free, you don't know how to handle your freedom. You may think you're just free from, you may forget that you're free for, and what do you need to help you? Not only the internal working of the spirit to learn how to, to learn from others, how to let the spirit continue to give you freedom, but you need the help of your fellow Christians. And uh, I think it's very true. I've seen it. I saw it after 50 years of uh, working as a pastor and counselor, working as a Christian leader. I found it to be true that there's very few people who stay personally free unless they meet regularly with other Christians. And it may not be an organized church, or it may be. Sometimes an organized church makes it worse on them, but it needs to have um, other Christians. That's why Paul would always try and find somebody that was mature and that he would let them be the leader to help train these others. So I'm saying is, is that uh, freedom is uh, like that little bird when you first find this new ability to not understand why you're free or what to do with your freedom or what does it mean. It takes more than just a momentary experience, doesn't it? Picking up on the, this is Roger, picking up on uh, the discussion about free will, uh, I think uh, I think unless we are free to choose, uh, we don't have the resolve. If we're told what to think, uh, we you can submit to authority because you're not free, but
but you won't really you won't really own the decision. The the saying that a mind changed against its will will hold the same opinion still. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, when you go back to the entering the promised land and we're told, choose this day whom you will serve. Well, you know, if, if we said, look, we're, I'm going to tell you who you're going to serve. We're going into the promised land and this is who you're going to serve. Well, who would own that? But yeah. when you're given that freedom to choose this day and, and every, every day I, I have to choose what I'm going to do. And when I choose, it strengthens my resolve because I, I decided to surrender. And then therefore I can benefit from the power and, and guidance of the Lord. Yeah, so helpful. Thank you, Roger. You know, this kind of leads me to a difficult question uh, for uh, Christians and, and Jews have struggled with for centuries. And that is, if God was totally against slavery from the very beginning because he himself was free and he made us to be free, he made us, every single human being, he wants to have freedom, personal freedom, corporate freedom, the ability to carry out what he has made us to be. That's what he wants. He doesn't want anyone to be having their ability taken away from them. If that's true, and God is all powerful, isn't that the age old question of if God is against slavery, why then did he allow slaves? Why did he sometimes even tell the slaves to obey their masters? How do you answer the question of if God is against slavery, why doesn't he just get rid of all these slave holders and slave owners? And why doesn't he just punish all these people, all these bad people? I guess it's cause it just leave you and me. And then sometimes I'm not sure about you, right? So why did God let slavery exist? Now, surely we got some opinions on that. Well, part of that is free will. Who is talking? This is Dora. Oh, hi Dora. Okay, part of that is free will. He gave us this free will. And part of that free will is us and the way we react to others. The other thing is that we have, when you give, get freedom, there is this emptiness unless you have something ready to put in place of the slavery. Yes. And that is a maturity that not all people are ready to do because it is a personal thing. Yes. Well, why, that's good. Why do you think, why do you all think that uh, God allowed some of these people to own slaves who were leaders of the Jewish faith in the Old Testament? No, this is Janet. Your question falls in the category I put things like, why did God let you have cancer? Why did God let a drunk driver hit a car and kill people? Why did God let China control their whole people? All of those kind of questions fall into that category. Is that God is not somebody that's controlling us. And it goes back to Dora's comment about free will. We do have free will, God's letting us have free will. If he wanted to control everything, he would take our free will away. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Thank you, Janet, that's good. Why did God put up with all this slavery stuff? Uh, this is Roger again. I, I like what Janet said because Jesus told us in the world you will have tribulation. Yeah. And, and slavery is just another form of tribulation, but it's also an opportunity for those of us who belong to the Lord to do something about it. Poverty, slavery in many forms today, some things we can't do anything about, obviously, but 
there's there's opportunities when there's problems. If if there's no problems, are we in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, I think, I think Roger, you put a uh, you put your finger on a very important issue, and and it's kind of like. Paul said, he said, you know, we're all sinners saved by grace. We're all sinners set free by grace. And what if there was no grace? You're saying, well, you know, God let some of those people be slave owners. Why is that? Well, somebody might turn around. A, the Jew would turn around and say, well, I'm glad he didn't kill all of us who were controlling of other people because I don't know anybody that doesn't try and control other people. Um, it's your wipe out all of us, or at least most of us, it, it could be because of God's mercy and God's patience and the responsibility of God's people. Um, it, it could be that, that God is merciful, uh, meaning that if he only used justice, uh, we'd all be in bad shape. So uh, I, think, I think one of the answers Paul gives us is, uh, I, I like to say two things. One is that, that that God is so merciful that he doesn't want, he, if, he, if he punished slave owners, he'd have to punish us for the other things we do and we'd all be wiped out. And I think another thing is that, that uh, we have to look at slave owners, people who keep people in poverty here in America, people who won't let people learn, people who mistreat other people, treat them like they're not worth anything. In other words, treat them like slaves. We have to say, what would Jesus do? Paul's answer was always, how did Jesus treat these people? And I, therefore we must respond the way Jesus responded. He didn't get together a bunch of troops and say, let's go kill all these slave uh, owners. Uh, Jesus method is our method. We may not like Jesus method sometime, we get caught up in our culture, but Paul said that's what we must look at is Jesus is our model. Did you have something, Phyllis, you want to add? Well, I was just thinking about God's activity in the history of Israel. How he, he well, I chose Moses to go to Egypt and, and set the people free. And then they wandered around and we all know those stories about how they behaved. They'd behave for a while and then they'd wander off and become willful, wayward children. And then they decided we want to be like the countries around us. We want a king. And God allowed all that. He allowed them to go their own way, kind of speaking as, as Janet did to God gave us our freedom and he is not going to step in to that arena to take our freedom away. But as you just said, Phil, we are so grateful for God's mercy because there comes a judgment day, but we can, we can appreciate God's mercy and his understanding in, in those situations. Thank you. Anybody else have a thought on that? Yeah, Bill, this is Judy. Yes, Judy. Okay. I, um, on Matthew 25, verse 21, it says, Well done, good and faithful slaves. Faithful with our few things I will put in change of many. Enter into the joy of your master. So I think he uses a lot of the slaves, you know, to build his kingdom. And I'm thinking of Kairos, and when we go there, they think of us as free people, you know, yeah. and still they say, you are free people. And when the three days or four days are over, they have found that freedom, but they have found it in Jesus Christ, you know, and so now they feel like at least they have hope. Because God is, like you say, is so merciful and so forgiving. And after all of these, what well, we have 47 Kairos now, and each Kairos has 42 men. So look how that has built. And they are there to support each other. And so now they have freedom in Jesus Christ. And just the plug for Kairos, uh, talked about recidivism a minute ago. Yes. The average in Texas is about 82%. 
And for inmates that have gone through Kairos, it was about 21%. There you are. Amazing. That is, that is, that is predictable. That's the story. Well, since you brought that up, Fred, it, it brings back to my mind uh, the question of what is, again, what does it mean to be uh, free and what does it mean to be a slave? You know, I'd have to say if, if, uh, if we listen closely to Paul in this letter to the Philemons, um, I think Paul would be saying, uh, there's some of you who think you're free, but you're not. Here I am chained to a wall facing execution and I'm a free man. You know, your definition of freedom has to do with uh, your perspective. You may think you're free because you're not poor, you're educated, you got all this stuff. And Paul would say, no, you're a slave to your ignorance. You don't realize you have eternity coming just down the road. It may be next, it may be tomorrow. God's going to have you called home. Are you really free? Are you free from your sin? Are you free from your past? Are you, are you able to face God in eternity? So I think a lot about freedom is, uh, is free, meaning who is your owner? Who is your kurios? And Paul made it very clear over and over again in his testimony. Uh, his testimony was Jesus the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah. He is my freedom. He is my kurios. So I, I think we look at it today, uh, that's a big question you have to ask, don't you? Every day when you look at all of this injustice and when you look at some people, I know the question like, uh, like Janet was bringing up a while ago is that there's some things we can, and why do the rich stay, get richer and the poor get poorer? Why do the why do the uh, educated get all the privilege in their families and those who are uneducated and poor can't get any? Uh, I think there's, there's that same point that we have to make is, is that we have the responsibility as other Christians. But on the other hand, we have to say, but well, what is the most important? Uh, some of you who, uh, who have re read these uh, books on how to carry the message of Christ to other lands, uh, just like you who, who, who work in the, uh, in the different ministries for poor people, you have to decide what does it mean to help these people? Uh, is, is, you know, the book, When Helping Hurts. Is it just to give them more food, to give them more education, to give them money? Are they really free when they get that? Sometimes I think we have to realize that maybe, I know Phyllis and I used to, on our trips to Guatemala, we used to say, you know, these people have a free, these Christians have a freedom we don't have. They're not tied down by all the things we are. So what is true freedom in your life? You may have, you may have true freedom while you're sick. You have some terrible disease. You have some terrible problem. You have all these things around you that, you, that are miserable physically, but you may be able to say, I hope that all of us in this, this uh, class can say, but I know true freedom. I have been forgiven. I know whom I serve. I know where I'm going. I'm so grateful that the Lord is my owner and I'm safe in his hand. I really am free. Um, it's, a different, it's a different way of looking at things, isn't it? Um, I, I wanted just to kind of push this one more step is uh, one of the things that that the anti-Christian world uh, says, when they look at people like Paul the apostle, who said to slaves in his day, slaves obey your master. What was Paul getting at? Why didn't he say, don't obey your master? Forget that. These people are evil. Burn their stores down, uh, fight them, shoot them, kill them. Why did he say, obey your master? Anybody got any ideas on that? No, this is Les. Um, I almost wonder, you have to decide who is your master. So, I mean, so, yeah, you may be uh, working on a plantation and you've got an owner that owns you and tells you what to do, but I'm wondering if he is saying go deeper in you know, when you have a relationship with Jesus, you know who your master is. And then the question is, 
are you willing to obey your master? And, uh, you know, as you were talking about modern times and slavery and all that, I agree how, you know, God has given us an opportunity to be what he created us to do, but we're slaves to all different kinds of things that prevent us from doing that. You know, it might be fear, might be, but there are things you can overcome, but you choose not to. And so, um, you know, even, even people that are in, appear to be in a good position can still be slaves. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Why would Paul tell slaves to obey their masters? What else? I'll throw a little, I'll throw a little uh, icing on that one. Um, why would Paul tell you and me, as he told those early Christians, Christians, obey your authorities. Their authorities were evil. Their authorities were violent. Many of them were very cruel. And Paul said, obey your authorities. By the way, that's what got him in prison. Uh, you know, he was a Roman and he was obeying the prison, uh, the Roman rule to go to court. So he went to Rome, went to court, he ended up in prison. So what did Paul mean? Slaves obey your master. Uh, Christians obey the authorities. What, what is that about? Is that, is that a, a, a passive, a nonviolent, pacifist approach to life? All right, well, this is Roger again. I uh, think go back before Paul and look at the guidance Jesus gave. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. If you're forced to go one mile, go two. Isn't that the, the same of let's, let's trust God to, to be just and not, not feel like that uh, we can move away from the teachings of Christ just because of uh, some social expediency. Yes. I think it's a critical point I want to underline, Roger, that you just touched on is that I think after years of learning the hard way, Paul realized that our model is not what makes sense, but our model is to pattern our life and actions after Jesus. And what would Jesus say about his authorities, his Jewish authorities? He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And both Jesus and Paul had to model submission, uh, giving up ease for the bigger good. And one other thing he says, be submissive, why? Because maybe my actions of trying to be bold to set myself free might get my family and my friends all murdered. So sometimes us being willing to be submissive is for the body, but sometimes it's like Peter said, I must obey God rather than men. So there are times when it says enough's enough and we have to take on, uh, take on a boldness. But I, I think you're right, Roger. I think our model must be Jesus even when it's not expedient uh, and it's certainly not easy. Anybody else uh, have any, any thought about that? This is Fred. I think there may be two reasons. One is simple to maintain order. Yes. And number two is that your actions could possibly influence the master's action and convert them and bring them to Christ. Amen. I think that's crucial. Thank you, Fred. That's a great reminder. And isn't that what Jesus did? Uh, did Jesus have to be crucial? Did he have to be submissive and let them beat him up and crucify him? What if, what if he said, okay, you're going to beat me. You're going to hurt me. Okay, that's it. I'm calling the angels in. And why didn't he do that? He could, couldn't he? Boy, that's a hard path to follow, isn't it? Bill, this is Janet. 
I read something today about uh, this book of Philemon is that this is the only letter Paul wrote where he didn't talk about Jesus's death and resurrection to try to convert somebody. He did it by the way he acted. He acted like Jesus and that got the slave Onesimus saved. So that just reminds me that that's what we need to model. We need to model Jesus through our actions all the time because everybody's watching. And maybe through those actions, people will come to Christ. Good. Good, Janet. Thank you. When people ask me over the years, um, especially when I used to be on a debate team, when they would ask me the question, does God allow slavery or does God believe in slavery? because the Old Testament had an awful lot of leaders who had slaves. And I would say, God hates slavery. It's against his very nature. He hates anything that enslaves, that limits his people, whether it's the person themselves or their people around them or their environment, God hates it. And sometimes in his mercy and in his patience, he seeks to turn their will and change their heart. He does not always dominate, but there is a time sometimes when God says enough's enough, but you can always be sure that God's against it. Uh, anybody have any final comments about this whole idea of being free? And I tried, I got close to the edge, but I tried to stay out of politics. But I think if you, uh, on your own, as you're doing your devotional, and as you have someone you're doing your devotional with, uh, that you might talk about the application of these principles of what it truly means to be free, what the role of the community is, what the role of fellow Christians should be, and what actions should we take uh, and follow the pattern of Jesus and not necessarily of our religious leaders who themselves are oftentimes highly prejudiced. Fortunately, you and I are not, but we're the only pure ones in the world, right? Well, I guess our time is up. It's been a good study and I'm glad to see all of you. Let's continue our prayers for these that we've talked about. And if you have other prayer requests, please send them to Carol and uh, we'll uh, put them on our prayer list. And on Wednesday morning, when we have our uh, time of prayer, we'll pray for them. And each of you do that in your own devotional life. Uh, oh yeah, Phyllis just reminded me, uh, next week we're gonna have a special guest. I'm gonna be, uh, uh, teaching the big, the big, big book of Hebrews, which emphasizes Jesus as the high priest. And uh, I'm going to have as a guest who's going to the first few uh, minutes, he's, uh, he's going to speak to us. And that's Andy Muck. Dr. Andy Muck is a uh, head of, uh, of uh, emergency medicine for the University of Texas uh, University Hospital System. He's a great friend. He's been with, with us on mission trips to Guatemala. But he's a tremendous uh, leader and Christian, and I think you'll enjoy hearing his story. And I'll send you a note by email about it. But think about next Sunday, uh, Randy Muck will be there. We'll do Hebrews, and we'll talk about this whole idea of the high priest and what does that mean in us in our everyday lives. Good to have you here, and see you next time. God bless. Thank you. God bless.